afternoon and a fantastic turnout. You are all very welcome to witness what, of course, is going to be history. We are celebrating one of our torchbearers. We are celebrating our history makers. So without further ado, you are very welcome to Peckin's Records Blue Black Ceremony. And I'm going to now introduce you to the man who makes this all possible, along with his team. Can you now put your hands together for Mr or Doctor, rather, Doctor Jack Buna. Come on, guys, make some noise. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and apologies for the uh, slight delay in both the mic and the start. But first of all, we have to give thanks to Ja, because we have the sun with us. So, ladies and gentlemen, can we give all of West London a big Ja? Yes, yes. That we are dealing with today. We're here to celebrate someone really special who gave to our borough, who gave a sense of culture, a sense of adventure, a sense of real love and warmth through their, their love of music. And our culture is what makes us, it what defines us, and it takes us back to our roots and gives us a vision for the future. So to be here to celebrate that, I think is terrific. As a family, as a community, and as a group of people, so many thanks to you and so many thanks to this place that was once a proper record shop where they had proper vinyl and proper music. <laughs> and it's terrific to be here. Thank you very much indeed and welcome. Yeah. It's a special day for our family. I don't know where you are, I'll see and Trevor, um, a Daddy Peckin sibling, to be really, really, really honoured to be receiving this plaque today because it's like when my dad came from Jamaica, he didn't come with this vision. When I look across, I see customers, friends, all these great, great grandchildren, grandchildren, nephews and nieces. And I'm, on behalf of my brothers and myself, we're very, very honored to appreciate this black from the council, Anubi and Jack. We've been championing this for a good while. Um, I can say it's very emotional. I've never practiced anything, it's just off the cuff. I thank everyone for the massive turnout we have today on behalf of Peckins Love. Oh. Good afternoon, family. Oh. Good afternoon. Oh. Wow, wow, family. Yeah. And our, our notable guests. Before I, I say anything, well, my name is Kennedy Menson, aka President journalist, broadcaster, and music publisher. Before I say anything, today, I would first of all like to recognize the Indian Jack for the work that he's been doing with these blocks. First of all, so if you could give him a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Give you the reason shortly. Secondly, there are two of Mr. Price's children here. Can we, can we see both of them so you can both? Oh, they're breathing. Oh, my bad. Oh, like you said, an apple don't fall far. Right. So come, come forward so yeah, people can see you. Yeah. This is the beginning of the legacy. Their children, their grandchildren, Mr. Price's great grandchildren, those are the beginnings of the legacy. Now, as a journalist over the years, I started in this reggae game some 30 years ago. One thing that we, we, we recognize over the years is as reggae has influenced other music forms, our children and our grandchildren and their generations of musicians believe that they are always the first. Come, 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 they're, all of you. Come away. They're, they're, they're thinking, come, Lara. Yes, there's plenty of room. They're always thinking that they are creating the wheel. When you create a, a jungle come, music, come, you believe come, you're creating come, come, the wheel. When you create funky house, when you create garage music, when you move forward to grind, they're all, all these kids are thinking that they are creating the wheel. What they're not understanding that they are building upon a legacy that was already set in stone, a foundation that they are stepping on, some shoulders that they are stepping on. And one of the reasons why they always think, our kids always think that they're recreating the wheel is because one, they think that the generations before didn't do anything. So when we have occasions like this, 
and we have plaques like this, we can now point to these plaques and show our children that yes, we did do something in this country. We can tell the media, yes, we did contribute to the fabric of British society, of European society, of world society, from a little island in the Caribbean and trans transported to the UK and from the UK spread to the world. And this is what we are celebrating today. And that is why I asked you to recognize the beginning of the legacy of Mr. Peckham. As a man in this country, one thing that you always want to do is leave a legacy. And today, that legacy is being recognized. Yeah, good afternoon, each and every one. You know, we're really thankful to Nubian Jack and to Amy Smith and Fulham yeah. Council. Because we've been here from a very, very long time. It's a belief. I know my father is getting the plaque, but my mother is also getting it as well. Because she's a driver for us. Yeah. And um, my family. Yeah. Our family. You know, yeah. It's um, humble beginning. And we're still very humble. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we're, we're people of the people, and that's why we're here today. Because we're thankful that you're celebrating my father. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to just spend a little bit of time not talking about Pekins, but about Auntie Gertie. You see, behind every big man, yeah. behind, behind every powerful family, there is a powerful, a strong, and a big woman. Yeah. Yeah. I will be indulgent and I will talk for a little bit about this phenomenal woman. The woman Mr. Price followed to England. Remember, she came first. Right. <laughs> she had a firm hand and a strong personality. She had to. That house was filled with men coming and going all the time and with music. She seemed to have the capacity to feed the nation. So she fed everybody. And she still had room to look out for the children on the street. So she would look out at all of us. And there were a lot of children on Benbow Road. The, the Simon brothers, a number of others, and even those like the McLeans who didn't live too far away down the road, there were lots of children on the street. And they came by regularly. And the funny thing was that much as I disliked my mother's bun, and if you're a West Indian, you know bun is important. I still can't tell my mother that. Thank God Auntie G, Auntie Gertie made up for it because she fed everybody and she looked after everybody. And that was one of the special things about her. She kept her safe. So, what I want to go on to say now is that it is so easy nowadays, you hear people talking about it takes a village to raise a child. And many of us who know that saying, it slips off our tongue so easily. And sometimes we think it makes us sound as if we know a lot. But let me just say this. Before my very eyes, the, the prices was actually created that village. Before my very eyes, they were created a legacy by their example. They were holding up our culture. They were bucking the racist trend that said our place was only to be consumers and never creators. They were being the trendsetters. They were being the ambassador for all music and our culture. So now, Chris and Duke, as you carry on this legacy, all I want to say is thank you. Because today, as we remember the giants, not just your father, the giants your parents were, as we remember that we are standing on their shoulders, I say, Mr. Peckins, Mr. Price was the first to do this in the family, to leave home and to do this for his family. But he has gone on to leave a legacy that we need to follow to do for our family and our people because we stand on their shoulders. He has started the building, it is ours to continue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. In 1927, in July of 1927, 
um, he's what you call a Kingstonian born and bred. Right. Born in Kingston, under the clock, so to speak. Lived all over Kingston. And um, he attended Ebenezer School, Darling Street. You might well imagine I'm a Kingstonian too. Like my parents, and they were friends with Pickens. Anyway, um, on leaving school, Pickens got a job. He was fortunate enough to get a job at the wharf, Kingston Wharf. That was a big job in the days because all the little lost little thing happened, you know. Pickens had a job. He was the eldest of four siblings. So he was not only the eldest, but also a father figure for the family. Every one of the siblings beneath him looked up to Pickens as a big brother and father. He was the one who took care of the house. He earned quite well his off, off the job. He also dabbled with barbering sometimes. I remember in the house, Pickens used to try and trim me when Pickens put his hand on your head. That was it, man. Your neck would pick. Anyway, the man was big and strong and heavy. Yeah, anyway. You got it? <laughs> heavy, big and strong and heavy. Not in character also. Big and strong and heavy in character. Anyway, Pickens told me that of his association, and I listen very keenly, with Cox and, and Studio One. Right? He said, um, first of all, let me tell you how he got his name Peckins. His, the name Peckins was triggered from the fact that Peckins was a man who loved the dancer. The wicked dancer, they said. And he had a special shuffle. <laughs> they called it a Peck. And right. it, it hence the nickname of Peckins, and it stuck to him like glue. Anyway, at the dancer, I don't need that. <laughs> in a dance hall, he got he was so became so popular he decided to keep his own dances. So he started to keep dances here and there and using all the big sounds at the time. Tom the Great Sebastian, um, King Edward, tell me some more man. Count Nix, Lord Pooh's, right, he used to use them and the Coxon. Now Coxon came as a last resort, I suppose. Because Coxon was the man who used to have a liquor store around the corner and pick, used to buy liquor for the dancers. From anyway, as the dance developed, he developed you know, a bonding with Coxon and Prince Buster at the time. At the time, Prince Buster and Coxon had Anyway, he, um, right, okay. yes, yeah, it's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not trying to pick his talk, unless he's telling me lies, and I don't think he would. <laughs> <laughs> he said that, um, yes, right, oh, today's a call. Anyway, he said to me, um, the bonding grew and the relationship got stronger and stronger. And he, up to, he reached a point where he exclusively used Sir Coxon downbeat as a sound system, none other. It was Coxon all the way. As like I say, the bonding grew and then he was getting his liquor from Coxon. And um, eventually, Coxon decided that he wanted to venture into record production. Now, I suppose he had a limited amount of funds. You know, money was limited in them days. And it was a, a rather expensive venture. So he leaned on Pickens a bit. Yeah, I got him on the family. <laughs> and Pickens would lend him a little money here, a little money there. So much so that he got so involved. And Miss Dirty, Pickens' wife, she got annoyed because she thought that this man, some, she said to me, sometimes the man would take my money and go and lend to Coxon to put in the record business. <laughs> she was very annoyed, she says. Anyhow, after, cut a long story short, the business developed, and I suppose Becky must have got his money back then somehow. In 1959, not before seven including myself. <laughs> Better believe that. <laughs> 1959, Miss migrated. She, she came to London, to the United Kingdom, leaving Pickens and children behind. She paved the way, as you were told. To, to. And um, after a year, she convinced Pickens to join her. So he came up 1960. Needless to say, when he arrived, he had a mountain of records with him. She said the records were so much they couldn't fit in that little room that they were living in. 
she had to put some outside in the passage. Surely, but sure, surely, surely, within gosh, I'm sorry, within days, it was inundated with calls and visits from all the sound men around London and beyond. They came to buy these records. There was a, a scarcity of records in them times. But Peckins was a man on the, on the ball and he was selling records in the miscurity. Anyway, they decided that, okay, they should do a distribution for So they started to import and bring up these records from Cox, Studio One, and all that. Anyhow, they graduated. And then after a while, Peckins decided, hey, I've got to make a move. I've got a family in Jamaica. My children are there. I've got my wife here. Chris is a little baby now. So, and he thought, well, I've got to find a job. So, he, his first job was at the, the food distributor. And then he didn't like that job and he moved on to a more better position job. Somewhere in the West End, it was a, a, a perfume company. Lawrence. Lawrence. Yeah, Lawrence. perfume Lawrence. company. He, he remained there for about 20 years. And um, during that time, he was still importing his little records from like, Studio One. He was the main man. And everybody was buying, and, you know, everything was okay. But Coxon wanted more. Coxon wanted expansion. Coxon wanted a proper distribution. Coxon was inviting him, urging him, go and get a shop. So we can do a thing. They can decline, kept on declining. Because of course he acknowledged that his family came first, so to speak. Although he was very loyal to Studio One. Anyway, miraculously, 1974, the kids got up one day and said, listen, I'm going to open the shop. He came along and he found it. It's shop. I was one of the first people here with him when the shop next to it. and um, started a little record business there on a, a small scale record shop but it was big business big business in that he was the main studio one if not the only distributor studio one music in the country at the time and he was developing and listen man that shop was something to behold tiny shop like that and you come in there and everybody passed through there trust me all the celebrities you can think of on the radio station, what Radigan, everybody, everybody came to take it to shop. Right? That's where I met Radigan in 1976 in the shop. Right? But of course Pekins had his ways. You know, he had a little weakness. You know a little weakness that you you'd um you come there and you see a sign, back soon. <laughs> and you sit on you sit outside and back soon because you're eager to get the record. And you'll be there. For a hour, the man back soon. <laughs> Sooner or later, you see him walking slowly from down the road. Yeah. <laughs> a little betting shop down the road. <laughs> Light ropes. Get a seat in there. <laughs> anyway, when he got here, got behind the counter, he was raring to go. And Pekins would go behind the counter. Hey, one thing with Pekins, when he's selling records, he's dancing. I'm telling you, when he start dancing, you go to buy two tuna and end up buying ten. <laughs> you go, then when you go outside, say, I know, but I haven't got the bus here to get home. Anyway, <laughs> and that was the kind of man picking. He was so inspiring. And he had so much to impart that you would listen, you would listen, you would listen. And he had a way, he had a, he had a way of Pekins commanded respect. He didn't have to ask for it, he commanded it. Just the way he spoke and what he did, he commanded respect. And he'd sort of always say, especially me, Listen, <laughs> listen, <laughs> listen. <laughs> yeah, Pickens, all the special places. What a, a beautiful day today. The revealing of Pickens black, blue black. My name is Milton Campbell. I play alongside Chris Pickens and Likominti. We're the Pickens Syndicate. And for me, it's such an honorable day to see such a beautiful thing happen for Chris's dad and for Chris and Duke. I've just come to support. I saw a little bit of little viewing, so I'm just in awe and I'm happy for all you got, man. Happy for the pecking syndicate. Would you just in the sun of the most I children that he shall be like Mount Zion. Keep away 
from all the evil doers. For they only put you in multitude of sinner. So don't you keep the bread. Aye. Okay, we're going to count down five to one and then we're going to unveil the plaque, Roy. What's the name of your name? Tyro. Tyro, okay, wonderful. So, ladies and gentlemen, from West London, Askew Road, five, five four, three, two, one. Two. Packing record. Help produce reggae to the UK and Europe. Pioneer in record label and shop established here by George Pekins Price, 1927 to 1994. Beautiful. That's going to be installed up there in the next hour. We're going to go over to the pub and have some drink and some good stuff. No, 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 no. Lift you up, man. Do you put your hand on it? Yes. Well, my name is um, Charlie Phillips. They know me as Smokey. They know me as Smokey Joe. And they know me as Red. This event you see here today, I hope not a lot of people have documented the proper history of our community and our contribution. One of the things about Mr. Peckins, I used to follow him as a kid. He yeah, had this record shop and he used to bring records in. And um, it's so sad, very sad, that he's been left out amongst the mainstream historians because if it wasn't for people like him, what is now British popular music, what is now British popular music, our community has been left out of it and we haven't been given proper profile. Um, I always say this, if it wasn't for our influence regard music in England, we gave Britain Beatles, we gave Britain the Rolling Stones, we gave Britain Elton John and others. And it's so sad how the modern day historians has left people like Mr. Pickens out. I remember Mr. Pickens as a young kid when he had early, this is before reggae or blue beat ended, he used to split himself a lot of blues records and this is what the early sound system in Jamaica used to play when I was a kid. American influence music as well and we brought this over here, we brought this over here and um, I remember as a kid we used to play all these American records on the blue spot radiogram and our white neighbors would say turn that music down Turn that jungle music down or turn that voodoo music down. And love and behold, 60 years later, it's become part of British popular music. And every up and coming British artist has to look back. It was not created, it wasn't created in England, yeah? as the historian wants to predict. It was created by our presence in England, our presence and also the native um, Afro-Americans from the, the bases who, 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 who brought this type of music. Then Elvis Presley came after, you know? A day like this for Mr. Pickens is well overdue because I thought, what's disappointing, I thought I'd see some of the um, top historians are some of the top sounds who should be involved in reggae music but you know he's given supplied records to some of what you call the top sounds as a young man I used to follow our um, Count Suffolk and Dukeville and who supplied the record? 
Pekins. The up and coming sound man. Pekins, they have to come for records, yeah? And it's so sad that he's been left out of what is now British popular music. And the historians, the real historians who write about British popular music has excluded him. We're coming up to the seventh generation now, yeah? And um, there's a missing gap within our history. Why? Why? Because our generation never passed our legacy on, yeah? Like when I was growing up, you could not ask big people questions. They'd say, shut up, lick a pick, no must be seen and not be heard. And this has caused a missing gap in our history. So I'm saying to all you out there, you must talk to the grandkids or talk to the picnic and tell them where you come from and what you used to do because there's a missing gap in our history which hasn't been properly documented. It's important. History we can tell it through the arts, we can tell it through the music and orally, orally, but it's about time with the younger generation they have to start jotting things down because we didn't shot anything. We still have the whole African traditions, whether you like it or not, where we tell our story orally, but it hasn't been passed around. But this is a nice day for, to celebrate Mr. Pekins, and I hope, they, I hope the historians will include, him, will include him in what is now popular British music, because our contribution has been excluded. I'm really proud to be a part of this family. Obviously, I'm only 15, so I wasn't here to like see the original shop and everything. So it's good to like hear people talking about like what's happened in the past and like see how really big the Peckins family was. I came to England in 1963, yeah? November the 22nd. And like my dad and some of his friends came to pick me up at the airport. Well, I actually had a suitcase full of records. There was nothing else in the suitcase, just records. And I, we were living, they were living in Shepherd Bush Green, a road called Padmore Street. And by the time we get to that house, there was people standing on the stairs. My mum standing out there, there four or five men waiting to buy them tune. <laughs> And for me, it was just like an introduction into selling records that really lasted me all my life. I used to be around the house all the time. I even remember that every Thursday, I used to take him to sell the music, because he didn't drive. I used to drive him around to all the different music shops. So and when I think about that, I think, God, I can't believe I did all that. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, it was like, um, that was like part of my life then. I'm so privileged um, to receive this plaque from my dad. It means a lot, not just for me, but for my community, because this is going to be here long after we're gone. And now you see the places being gentrified. We'll have our markets still up in places like Shepherd Bush. Yeah. Give thanks. I'm Gerald Price. I'm the grandson of George Peckins, aka George Peckins Price. I'm Chris Peckins' son. Um, and I'm the last, well, the next generation, shall I say, to carry on the torch. Um, this means a lot to the family and a lot to everybody that's, you know, thank you for coming down, you know, for what my granddad's done for the community and everything he's done for Black History. It's, it's amazing to see him now get his, his, you know, recollection for everything that he's done. And, you know, Dad has been carrying the torch alongside my Uncle Duke and my Uncle Trevor. And now we're able to see, you know, a new generation bring that torch into the full effect, which would be myself. I'm more than proud of, you know, everybody in part, you know, that's taken part in this, and um, especially Newby and Jack, and you know, the council for making this happen. You know, that's a, a really big up them for that man. It's a lot of respect, and I was able to remember the shop when it was here. Um, I'm 25 now, born in '96, so I wasn't able to actually meet my granddad, but we you know, he's here with me. He's able to help me on the journey. And that dancing that we was all heard, hearing about earlier, that, that Peckin's name's still within me. So, you know, it's about to make that generation proud. And, you know, in 10 years' time, we can probably look back at this footage and see another piece of history being made. So, a large and big up to that. I've come here to support um, Chris. I've known Chris and Duke for quite a while. Um, and obviously, this is a momentous occasion 
for you know for the family and for the community so I thought it was a good thing to come and to represent um, not only my family who couldn't make it but um, the, the people here to see this plaque go up yeah well I used to have a little sound still but not as big but I used to, I've got a lot of his studio one and vinyl and ska music from this, this man. Mm -hmm. And I still, I still buy music from the sons, Chris and Drew. But you knew about, yeah. And I respect the foundation. It's about time to put it up. But nothing before the time. But that's my plan. It's a blessing. Thank you to Nubian Jack and, and all the people around him to putting up this blue plaque and we need to put up another more blue plaques around, around London and in the UK which we're going to aim for the 100 blue plaque in the UK. When I came here as a Jamaica government scholar, civil engineering scholarship winner in the early 1970s, this was how I met Mr and Mrs Price living at 20 Benbow Road. In Hammersmith, Golock Road is the separation between Hammersmith and Shepherd's Bush. And my mother was sending records to me from Jamaica. She was a school teacher for me to sell to sound systems in England because I told her that there's a market here to sell sound systems, Jamaican pre-release records, reggae records that have not been released. And so my mother started to send records to me in 1972. And when I met Sir Pekins, he was still doing his daytime job, hadn't opened the shop yet, because that was 1974. He asked if I could also sell some Studio One records for him, in addition to me selling my pre-release records that I got from Jamaica. And I said yes. And so I started to sell Studio One records also. And a lot of times I actually used to pick up the records to sell. Not from him, but from his wife, Mrs. Gertie, who worked at home as a seamstress. So she was there, she was the one who I got, actually picked up most of the records from because he was on his daytime job and was only able to do the selling of records on weekends or in the evenings. And so Roy Hawkeye, who was here, and who used to live with the Pecks, the family, after his mother threw him out. Also used to sell Studio One records. So Roy Arkay and I used to do this in the early 70s. And indeed, it is most fitting that Sir Pekins and his wife, let us not leave them out, I mean the, the, the wife, and she's not a woman who is behind her husband. She's beside him. This thing about behind every strong man, you know, there's a woman behind. No, the women are beside. They go together. And let us also, I am giving credit also to his two sisters, Shirley Pekins and Dorothy Pekins, who used to help in the selling of the records and the shipping sometimes, Sister Dorothy in Jamaica, shipping to here. And their brother, the Peck's brother, because there were four of them, Kudi, Kudi Peckins. So his sibling, his brother, Kudi Peckins, Shirley Peckins, and Dorothy Peckins, they all assisted in various ways to help their brother and his wife in the distribution of music from Jamaica in this country and it's more than reggae because when he was selling Jamaican records in this country in the 1960s there wasn't reggae we have mentor skia and rocksteady reggae only came about in 1968 so this is why I can't talk about just reggae but the other genres skia Mentor and rock steady. So long live Mr. and Mrs. Price and everyone who played a part in the mass distribution of Jamaican records in this country.
We can't see your face, please. Kwane! Big smile. The trophy. Yeah, it's the trophy. It's the trophy. It's the trophy. Mum, where's my wife? Hold it, that is upright. Hold it, that is upright. Dude, hold it, that is upright. It's upright. Pekins to the world. It's the world, man. Why not? Why not? Big day, big day, big day. Nice, nice, nice. nice. Pekins to the world. A war. Yeah, man. Yeah, man, nah. yeah, man. Yeah, man. Proud, proud. Yeah, <laughs> yeah man, we're proud, man. Yeah, man. Overdue, overdue. Overdue. Uh, overdue.